I don't think I would be over exaggerating if I said that the Spirit Blossom Festival came as a pleasant surprise to everyone. Especially with the storytelling part. Not only did the cinematics show us what happened with Yasuo and Yone, and what happened in the old Ionian legend before that, but since all the Spirit Blossom skins were also confirmed to be representing real spirits in the Ionian mythos. That means that all the Spirit Blossom stories, which you might have experienced through the client, are also technically canon. And that's what we are going to have a look at today. However, the main reason why I want to talk about all the different storylines isn't just because they are real stories, but it's because these spirits, which are a real part of the universe, reveal some really important information about how Runeterra works. And yes, some of them even talk about fiddlesticks. Which isn't a surprise, considering who wrote all the Spirit Blossom lore. So, just to quickly summarize how this works. Ionians believe that when someone dies, their soul goes to the spirit realm. And inside the spirit realm, the souls get to meet different spirits that determine what would happen to them. For example, they can get stuck in an endless tormenting loop, or they may find eternal peace. And the Spirit Blossom skins are representing the spirits inside this realm. Now, what may be confusing you is that the spirits still carry the names of the champions we know. But Riot just did this for the sake of the spirits being relatable. In reality, this spirit isn't actually Lilia. It's just a spirit that looks similar to her. So, in our heads, we can call her... Pelia. Just like this is now Bivan, Gasuo and Phone. Hopefully things are a bit less confusing now. So now, without further ado, let's go through all the Spirit Blossom storylines. And let's talk about all the easter eggs and interesting information which each of them reveal. At the very beginning of this event, every one of us got to meet the Fox, which we already know as the Gatekeeper. Interestingly enough, the story describes that we arrived at a beach, which is a place with its own purpose. Later on from Riven's storyline, we will learn that every spirit that arrives in the spirit realm starts from here. In fact, if you go back to the Path cinematic, you may notice that the Elder Brother started on this beach as well. Anyway. Straight from the beginning, the Gatekeeper asked us to follow, because the job of the Gatekeeper is to lead spirits to their peaceful afterlife. However, it is not her job to make the spirits follow. The Gatekeeper even hinted at the fact that it is still our choice whether we want to follow her. Then the Gatekeeper noticed that we have the scent of the living, which means that somehow we ended up in the spirit realm despite not being dead. But instead of helping us get to the spirit realm, the gatekeeper just gave us a map and told us to find another spirit who could help us. And so our journey began with the first choice of where should we start. Here I should point out that all of these storylines were written separately and that they are all happening at the same time. Although at the end we will reveal that there is some time skipping. So even though it may seem that canonically the main character is going through only one of these storylines, in reality it is a lot more confusing but more on that later. Either way, now it is our choice to pick where to start. I'll try to go through the champions in such an order so that you can see how some of the storylines cross over. So I am going to start with perhaps my favorite spirit, Timo. I know I didn't expect it either, but his story is pretty cool. Because Timo is the furthest away from the beach where you arrived, by the time you get there you are starving. And so Timo pulls his first prank on you. He lays down a trap in the form of a bunch of leaves and dirt, disguised as a delicious meal. Of course, there is no way to avoid eating it, and so you fall for it. After laughing in our face, Timo noticed that we are not a spirit, and so we don't belong here. But instead of helping us, to Timo, all that meant was that we were the perfect assistant to help Timo with some of his serious work. And so, even if you try to decline, Timo just ignores you and pretends that you agree. After that, Timo leads you through the dense forest, to a massive gate overlooking a river which was lit by lanterns. Then he says, I'm sure glad you agreed to do this mission with me, which, you know, we didn't. After which, he explains that this super dangerous and super secret mission was to play a prank on Thresh. He then tries to look for a good reason for you to help him, but not knowing much about you, Timo asks you where you're from, to which you have the option to say, from the physical realm, da. This excited Timo because he had never met anyone from da. Either way, because we aren't a spirit, we could help Timo because Thresh's magic wouldn't work on us. 
And so our mission was to sneak into his temple and steal his lantern. Normally we would have to be insane to go through this, but Timo promised that he would send us home after this. So again, even if you try to recline, Timo tells you that he will wait for your return. When you return with the lantern, Timo is surprised because he didn't think you could actually do it. In fact, it turns out that he lied about Thresh not being able to hurt you. If Thresh wanted, he could have torn us apart. Then Timo left to actually prank Thresh using the lantern. And so he asked us to wait for him for a couple of spirit minutes. However, multiple months pass before he finally comes back. You have the option to ask Timo about this. And he explains that two spirit minutes is about six months in our time. Give or take, because Timo wasn't sure how time worked in the. You also have the option to ask Timo about the prank he just pulled on Thresh. And there we can learn that Timo filled the lantern with mushrooms, he hid it in a bush, another person came to him, so Timo played rock scissors paper with them, he lost, and then Timo just skipped to the point and told us that the prank was a success. Which meant that now we were best pals with Timo. And so Timo made us repeat after him the best pals pledge. During which he also made us pledge that we would help him prank the spirit of reflection. Which is a name you should remember for later. At least Timo promised that he would really send us home after this prank. But in order for us to prank the spirit of reflection, Timo needed one tiny little object. Kindred's cloak. And so, somehow, we managed to sneak behind the spirit of death and actually steal their cloak. With this cloak, Timo wanted to disguise the two of us to look like a demon. So then Timo climbed on our shoulders, we put on the cloak and Timo put on a scary mask. Of course, because we were playing the lower half of the body, the cloak was covering our vision. And so we didn't see anything. But according to Timo, the spirit of reflection totally thought that we were a demon. So the prank was a success. Unfortunately, when it came to finally sending us home, Timo realized the cloak was magically stuck to our body. And the only way to break such a magical bond was by rubbing it with some spirit sap, which came from a spirit tree. However, the trees in that grove hated Timo. And so we had to get there ourselves, even though we were still totally blind because of the cloak. And so, just by reaching around in the darkness, we somehow managed to get some sap on our hands. Then we followed Timo's very loud and obnoxious voice back to him. And there he used the sap to remove the cloak. After this, it was finally time to send us back home. And just like that, we appeared in the physical realm. Or so we thought. This was just an illusion, which was another one of Timo's pranks. But then, after Timo sheds a few tears because he doesn't want us to leave, he actually hands us a map that would show us the way back to the lands of Da. Before we leave, we have the chance to upgrade our best pal status to being forever pals, which is a fancy spirit term for becoming best friends forever. According to Timo, when a mortal and a spirit become close friends, the spirit gets the ability to pop into the physical realm to visit their friend. And so Timo pushed us to quickly find our way home, so that he could visit us in the physical realm as soon as possible. That's it for Timo's storyline. If you decide to give him a spirit pedal for that sweet emote, he just wants to use the pedals to pedal bomb Thresh's temple. This was a nice and lighthearted story that didn't reveal a lot of juicy information, however. But that will quickly change as we dive into the story of Kindred. Before we start with this one, let me just mention that the Spirit Blossom Kindred are the exact same entity as normal Kindred. This is just how the Ionians imagine them. Also, Ionians call Kindred the Taker, which is a name that will make sense after this story. Just keep in mind that the Taker takes people away. You'll know why this is important later on. But the point is, we are about to get into some really cool death lore. When you first arrive in Kindred's forest, you're met by the wolf, who is hoping you start running. Because remember, the lamp and the wolf each have their own way of taking lives. The wolf chases down those who would try to fight death, and the lamp quickly ends the lives of those who accept death. Anyway, before the wolf is able to do anything, the lamp arrives, happy to find the wolf, because the two were playing hide and seek. Here it was revealed that the two play that game a lot, although the wolf always loses, because he's constantly growling, and so the lamp always finds him. When the lamp turns her attention to us, she points out how pale and shaky we are, which either means that we are scared, or it is a reference to the fact that all we do is play video games. The lamp then mentions that she's tired of always winning at hide and seek, 
And so she asks us to play with them. And because we have no other choice, that's what we do. Here I should quickly point out that from the view of the main character, we don't know that Kindred are the spirit of death. Right now we just see them as a wolf and a small girl. Anyway, the story actually gives us a choice of where we want to hide. But regardless of which spot you choose, the lamp always finds you. And so the wolf invites you to a very exclusive losers club, reserved only for you and the wolf. But then the lamp asks, how did a human get here? And they explain that the spirit realm is for the dead and the spirits, which means that these two are two separate things in the eyes of the spirit. The lamp then gets a little bit confused, because despite the fact that we are now in the spirit realm, they don't remember us. And that's because the kindred are supposed to meet every single being in the moment of their death. This was just a further proof that we weren't dead. But either way, the lamp didn't think about it too much. And instead, they started another round of hide and seek. But this time, we would be looking for them. Here you have a couple of great choices. You can decide to cheat, but the lamb will notice, and the wolf will kick you out of the exclusive losers club. Or you can just point out that you will never find them, because you don't even know where you are. Regardless of your choice, the lamb then explains that they are really good at hide and seek, because they can hop in and out of the spirit realm. That's how they get to meet mortals during their death. They just hop into the physical realm. After this, the lamb explains what we already know that she has to be present every time someone dies, to make dying easier on people. Or if someone doesn't want to die, the wolf would step in. She also explains that it is entirely the mortal's choice whether they decide to see Kindred. Most of the time they won't see them until the very last moment, but Kindred always sees all of them. And so that's why they are good at hide and seek. It's because it is their job to hide. But the wolf is still quite a bit easier to find. Then the lamp finally introduces them as Kindred, the spirit of death. They were the spiritual incarnation of death, which a human mind could comprehend. After this introduction, someone in the physical realm died, so Kindred had to quickly leave. A while later they reappear, and the lamp starts questioning you. Unfortunately, because we don't even know how we got here, or where our body was in the physical realm, Kindred can't find us. But the lamp then points out that oftentimes, physical objects can give spirits back their memories. Using herself as an example, she mentioned that there were objects which held her memories from times before she came to this realm. However, before she came here, she wasn't alive like us. Because she came from times before death was even a concept. Here the wolf confirmed that one day, Kindred simply appeared. But these objects could give them back their memories of what was before death. And so we decide to help Kindred and learn about the origins of death itself. On this adventure, the wolf decides to help us, because we are going to the warrior graveyard, where every soul wolf ever chased ended up. The lamp wasn't with him, because the wolf didn't want her to see this violent place. Anyway, the wolf then tells us to focus and use all our senses to find Kindred's memories. And so we close our eyes. We can hear lonely footsteps against the wind. Then there were voices shouting curses. And finally there was a flash of steel. Then the wolf points out three objects. A portrait, a grey coat and a knife. And you learn different things based on what you choose. The portrait reveals a man with black hair and very sad eyes. According to the wolf, the grey coat smells like soil and stone. And it had the scent of a tragic death. And the knife felt familiar to Wolf, as if he had held it before, or someone else held it to Wolf. Regardless of which item you choose, they are linked to Kindred's memories. The thing is, the Wolf knows how happy the Lamb was now. And he was afraid that if Lamb learned the truth, her endless blissful childhood might end. And so the Wolf gave the ultimate choice to us. Give the Lamb back her memories, which is what she desired, or keep her happy forever. When you finally get back to the lamp, you have no other option than to give her back her memories. And this is where we learn how Kindred came to existence. It turns out these items belonged to a man with black hair, sad eyes and a grey coat. This man was very lonely, because even though he met everyone in the world, nobody wanted to meet him. All he ever wanted was a friend, but he could never get one. Eventually everyone left him, and the others hated him for it 
because they thought he took them all away. The wolf then confirmed that this person was called the Grey Man, and he was the spirit of death. He wandered the world, known by everyone, but hated for what he was. Each night he went to sleep, hoping the next day would never come. But he always woke up, sad that he couldn't end his eternal suffering. So then he took a magic blade and he cut himself in two. He likely wanted to end himself, but instead he created the lamb and the wolf. So in the end the grey man found peace, not only in ending his own existence, but creating two halves that would always have a friend. Of course, in case you forgot, the story of the Grey Man finally gives meaning to Kindred's original release tale. Ram, tell me a story. There was once a pale man with dark hair who was very lonely. Why was it lonely? All things must meet this man, so they shunned him. Did he chase them all? He took an axe and split himself in two. So he would always have a friend. So he would always have a friend. This story ends with Lam being happy that there was someone who gave up everything to make sure she and the wolf had each other. And she even pointed out that if the grey man was watching, he would probably be happy that the two were always together. After this, when Kindred leave to attend another death, you can hear the same lonely footsteps which we have heard before we found the objects. But now the footsteps faded away. Of course, these lonely footsteps were those of the grey man which means that he's been watching the two all along. And now we are getting to the stories of the other spirits that are still very interesting. But they usually have just one or two interesting lines that reveal something cool. So I will go through the other storylines quicker. Although if you look at the length of this video, it's not as quick as you imagine. So now let's go to Vayne. When you first meet Vayne, you find her tracking down a demon. At first she is hostile towards you, but gradually she is willing to talk to you. In other words, Vayne is your typical tsundere, which becomes obvious after you get a cut on your cheek while following her and suddenly she is worried that you might get it infected. After which she has a sudden burst of hatred towards you. Long story short, Vayne is quite emotionally unstable. Anyway, she then asks us to make ourselves useful by helping her hunt down a demon. Apparently this demon slaughtered her parents in the night, which is an obvious reference to her real story with Evelyn. But although this demon was drawn to a larger amount of blood, Vayne couldn't find anything larger than a rabbit in these lands. And so, since we already had a cut on our cheek, Vayne decided to use us as a bait. During the hunt, when Vayne tells us to flash that cheek around to lure out the demon, we have the option to tease Vayne by saying, what cheeks are we talking about? Unfortunately, Vayne doesn't appreciate these jokes. Anyway, we spend a while waiting for the demon, but no one shows up which gets Vayne frustrated even more. Then she notices that our cheeks stopped bleeding for some reason, which might be a reference to the fact that either because time flows by quickly in the spirit realm, you just stop bleeding faster, or that the spirit realm heals wounds to retain the spirit's constant shape. Anyway, to turn us into a proper bait, Vayne had to give us a new cut, after which she had another emotional breakdown. Here Vayne kept explaining how the demon she was hunting took everything from her. And that's why she had to kill it. But then, before Vayne was able to give us a new cut, the demon revealed itself. During this battle, every time Vayne hit the demon, the demon hit Vayne back, perfectly mimicking every blow. From the visual representation, and from what was happening during the fight, to us it was obvious that this demon was a reflection of Vayne. That's why Vayne's own ankle started hurting after she shot the demon in its foot. But it took Vayne quite a while before she realized that. In fact, we had to point it out to her. Interestingly, since this is the demon Vayne was tracking the entire time, it gave Vayne the idea that she was who killed her own parents. And this realization really broke her. She then realized that the only way to get rid of the demon was to stop fighting it and to suppress her anger. And after she did that, the demon disappeared. She then explained what really happened to her parents. One day her village was attacked by a demon. It wasn't an Azakana. It was something they had never seen before. It was some kind of an ancient monstrous beast that fed on pain. When it arrived, Vayne was paralyzed by it. And so she just watched what it did to her parents. Of course, this means that it wasn't Vayne herself who killed her parents. It was still this other demon. 
And so the demon Vane was hunting down was her own obsession with revenge taking form. Anyway, since Vane's been hunting down her own obsessions for thousands of years in the spirit realm, after finally learning the truth, she was so happy she was willing to help us get back into the physical realm. That's it for Vane's storyline. So now let's move on to Riven. Let's quickly get this out of the way. Yes, Riven is just one massive reference to the Shaman King. And hopefully it's not a personal attack on me. Anyway, when you first meet Riven, it is in the middle of the Sword Graveyard, where, while under the influence of a dark spirit, Riven is looking for the pieces of her broken blade. She quickly mentions that once she finds it, and puts it back together, she would finally remember how or when she died. And so, because you have nothing better to do, you start snooping around looking for the broken pieces. Eventually, you return to Riven with a piece in your hand, and somehow this piece dampens the influence of the dark spirit and Riven comes back to her senses. In fact, before you give Riven the peace, if you tell her, say pretty please, she mentions that the dark demon that's looking over her doesn't want her to find these pieces. Interestingly, she then explains that she doesn't know where she is, and she doesn't remember how she got here. On top of that, she felt a quick vision rush through her when she touched the shard which we gave her. It was all very confusing to her. Here, I quickly want to point out a cool fact. Remember that this sword graveyard was the same place which the wolf talked about. Every person who was chased down by the wolf ended up here. Which means that Riven too was a warrior who didn't wish to die a peaceful death. Anyway, after this, Riven asked you to help her find all the pieces of her broken sword. Perhaps once she would find all of them, her memories would return. And we would learn what happened to her. At the end of this conversation, Riven also revealed that she was getting ready to take an enemy fortress, despite this battlefield being quite empty, which really showed us how confused Riven really was. Next time, when you return to her with even more pieces, you meet her in a forest. There, when Riven touches the pieces, you too get a new vision. You get to see two people standing over the body of a dead female warrior. The two people describe her as a great fighter, who easily broke through their front line and they say it was a waste to see her die. At this point, Riven, who stands right next to you in this vision, gets confused. And that's because she thought these two figures were talking to her, not to the dead body. Because this entire time, Riven believes that she is still alive. She doesn't know that she is dead, and that she is in the spirit realm. The two figures continue by saying that her blade was shattered completely, after which we hear the voice of the fox, asking Riven to follow. This of course indicates the moment Riven died, and then the vision ends. Unfortunately, even after we tell her that she's clearly dead, she still doesn't believe it, and so she asks us to get more pieces to learn the truth. But before we're able to do anything, out of nowhere Cassiopeia appears, and she mocks Riven that she can't let go of her past. Honestly, we don't really learn anything from this conversation. We just learn that Riven has been tracking Cassiopeia down for some reason. And then Cassiopeia leaves after she tells us that she is too weak. But before she does so, Cassiopeia laughs at us and tells us to check if we still have the shards of the blade which we have found. Right after she disappears, we learn that all the pieces are somehow missing. And so, without the pieces of the blade, the dark spirit looming over Riven tries to break out again. This part of the story might have felt like a confusing mess, but its purpose was to show us that Riven can only hold back the dark spirit if she has her blade. Anyway, after we venture out looking for more shards, the next time we return, we somehow manage to find almost all of them. However, when we hand them to Riven, we find out that Riven keeps losing the pieces. And when the pieces are gone, she gets obsessed by finding them again. And that's why Cassiopeia mocked her. It's because Cassiopeia represents the spirit of temptation, so really she was just teasing Riven. Anyway, this causes Riven to go into panic mode, and she tells us that she only remembers one thing from her past. She fought in the greatest battle ever fought in history. But if you remember the fact that all of these spirits are canon part of Runeterra, you may realize that this actually reveals that during the ancient times, perhaps around the times of the Titan War, there was a massive battle. And in this battle, Riven was tasked to rush through the enemy front line, straight to the commander and take him down. However, Riven doesn't remember how this battle ended. 
Then, after Raven calmed down a bit, she told us to dig under a nearby massive sword. Because it turns out, Raven wasn't just randomly losing the shards we gave her. She was just burying them underground. Because she wasn't sure if she wanted to learn the truth. She was a great warrior, and so she didn't want to know how she died. So, long story short, Riven lied to us, and now she's afraid that learning the truth would change her. And after we tell her that she's quite cool as she is right now, the decision making doesn't get easier. However, after some thinking, she just tells us to take all the shards and meet her on the beach. When we get there, Riven is a bit nervous, because she's not sure what would happen once the blade would be reforged. She might turn into a totally different person. And that's why, because she likes who she is now, she solved her problems by throwing the shards into the sea. To which you have an appropriate answer. After this, because the two of you became close friends on this adventure, Riven kisses you on the cheek, and that's how the story ends. So now, let's have a look at what was that Cassiopeia's part all about. When you get to meet Cassiopeia in her shrine, we learn that she is the spirit of temptation, and so she could sense our desires, and do whatever we wanted her to do. But before we have a chance to say anything, she coils around us, and squeezes us until we black out. When we then wake up, we don't really learn why she did that, but at least she was ready to give us what our heart desired, which she thought was a wooden comb. When we tell her that we didn't actually want this, she doesn't believe it for a moment, but then she explains what's happening. As the spirit of temptation, Cassiopeia's job was to help everyone realize their desires, so that they could reach the pinnacle of need. However, currently she was in a weakened state, because she was missing a few of her personal possessions. This meant that she wasn't able to properly sense desires, and so she asked us to restore her powers. Apparently, these objects of power were scattered around by her sister. Which in the real world would be Katarina, by the way. So in the future, Katarina might get a Spirit Blossom skin. Anyway, the point is, after Katarina scattered these items around, the other spirits picked them up. But now, we would bring these items back to Cassiopeia. And the first of these objects of power was a mirror that was stored in the Temple of Obsession. Of course, Thresh is the Spirit of Obsession. So that's who we had to deal with first. After we returned to Cassiopeia, she is angry at us that we only brought her the mirror, but she was missing her earring too. She then calms down because she realized she likely forgot to tell us about the earring. And that's when Cassiopeia reveals something interesting. She tells us how she came to be. Long time ago, she was the daughter of the headsman of their village. She was envied by everyone, and she was taught to never show emotions, because it could be seen as a weakness. When her father died, she inherited everything, including their enemies. Cassiopeia dealt with them swiftly, but still, one enemy remained. It turns out her sister, Katarina, didn't inherit anything, because their father didn't approve of her marriage. And of course, I am pretty sure Katarina's marriage is a reference to her relation to Garen, because Cassiopeia calls him a spinning oaf. So in the future, Garen might get a Spirit Blossom skin too. Anyway, together with her husband, Katarina attacked Cassiopeia, which forced her to leave on a horse. But since it was raining that day, the horse slipped and that's likely how Cassiopeia died. Now, the point of this entire story is that Cassiopeia is trying to tell us that all of the spirits we meet in the spirit realm started as humans in the physical realm. That's the new reveal. She then reveals that the three objects of power were the comb from her childhood, the mirror which she got when she was growing up, and the earring which she got when she was chosen to lead their house. So now that she had the comb and the mirror, she sent us to get the earring, which was held by a warrior standing in the graveyard of swords. And that's why the story of these two spirits crosses over. From Cassiopeia's point of view, she went to Raven to retake her earring. And so when we return with the earring, she puts it on, and she sends us to an innocent fawn hidden in a forest. Because for reasons she didn't want to share, she needed one of the fawn's pretty bows. Interestingly, Cassiopeia then mentions that it is weird how, with this bow, she feels like she wouldn't have any other desires. And desires were what defined her. What's cool is that if you tell Cassiopeia that perhaps the bow sucks, she tells you that the bow is infused with the power of loss, which is something you should remember till we get to Lilia. Anyway, she then tells us that this is the last task, 
and that should we return with the bow, she would reward us. And so when we return with the bow, Cassiopeia takes it and she announces that with these objects of power, she would become greater than salvation, obsession or even death. Soon these lands would belong to temptation. Which means that, yes, Cassiopeia betrayed us. And she just wanted more power to rule the spirit realm. This shouldn't be a surprise to us, because as she explained, we weren't the first ones she used. In fact, all the statues around us were the other souls who were lost to their desires. However, Cassiopeia then admits that it was nice to finally trust someone with a task. And so she decides to not claim our souls, but to let us go. As a nice bonus before the story ends, Cassiopeia explains that she shouldn't be called a spirit. She was Akana, which could be translated as demon, though in her case it wasn't entirely accurate. This information is cool because it ties to Fiddlestick's demonic compendium. Since the word Akana is similar to Azakana, as you'll see later, there is a link between those and the Spirit Blossom spirits. But there are more cool links, such as the fact that Thresh is the spirit of obsession, and here we can actually also find obsession. Anyway, after this, Cassiopeia simply leaves, saying that the two realms will never be the same. The end. If you thought this story wasn't as cool as you thought it would be, you have the chance to be a weirdo and you can keep asking Cassiopeia to squeeze you and crush your bones. If you keep doing that, eventually she will actually tell you how weird you are. So now, speaking of obsessions, let's have a look at the story of Thresh. Interestingly enough, when you meet Thresh, he doesn't want to straight up kill you, as many would expect. Instead, he realized we were lost. And so he offered us protection. What's cool is that when you tell Thresh that it is time for the Spirit Blossom Festival, he randomly mentions that the last time he talked to Time, he attempted to hinder his collection. But because Time had a capital T, that means that Thresh just revealed that there is a godly being that controls Time. Just like Kindred are death. Unfortunately, we don't get to learn who Time is. But it is a really cool teaser for a possible character coming in the future. Who knows, maybe Zillion is also getting a Spirit Blossom skin. Also, Thresh mentioned that he had done something bad to Time, so that Time could learn his place. And now, Time only works in the physical realm, which is a cool fact on its own. However, this could also be a really clever reference to the fact that Time flows chaotically in the Spirit realm. We learned that from Ari later on. And this might be because Thresh did something to it, and Time left the Spirit realm. Anyway, because we were lost, Thresh decided to show us his home. When we get there, we arrive at the river lit by lanterns, which you may remember from Timo's part. Here Thresh explains that he sees all spirits as his children, which he wants to protect. But funnily enough, this also indirectly makes Thresh a daddy. Thresh then explains that he is forced to look like an evil demon in a mask because he lacks some of his powers. And that's because someone had stolen away some of the spirits which he protected. Without them, Thresh can't hold this less demonic form for long. But even though it is obvious that Thresh could use our help, he tells us not to bother. We already got lost. And he didn't want to use us for his personal problems on top of that. So yes, out of all the spirits we get to talk to, Thresh is actually the nicest guy. Of course, because we had nothing better to do, we offered to help Thresh, at least by leading some of the nearby lost souls to his lair. The next time we return to Thresh's lair, with a few spirits in our hands, Thresh is very happy to see us. And for helping him, he decided to tell us about himself. He revealed that some saw him as a guardian, but he saw himself as a father, a caretaker of souls. The living believe that their diseased lost ones find safety in the spirit realm, and Thresh is making sure that stays true. But recently, another spirit with their own agenda started interfering with Thresh's goodwill. He knows they probably don't do it out of evil intentions, but they just believe they know better than him. But what was worse? Someone stole Thresh's lantern. Of course, I don't have to tell you who stole it, because we have already seen this part of the story from their perspective. Anyway, Thresh used this lantern as a beacon which led the lost souls to him. So without it, his children would be in danger. And so it was us who went into the woods to find the lantern. And here is where the brilliant part comes in. Remember how Timo left us waiting for him for months? And then when he came back he explained what happened during his prank on Thresh? 
Well, here we get to see it from the other perspective. As we search for the lantern, we start hearing a really annoying high-pitched laugh. And then we see it. The lantern is just sitting there. But as soon as we touch it, it explodes in a puff of smoke that smells like mushrooms. Then Timo trolls us by being completely silent, even as we talk to him. So then, out of desperation, we offer to fist bump him. Only for Timo to offer his palm. And so we make scissors out of our hand, and we beat him at a rock scissors paper game. The brilliant part is that if you go back, this exact scene was described in Timo's story too. After this, because we beat Timo at a fair game, he let us have the lantern, and we return to Thresh. There, inside Thresh's home, the lantern starts glowing, and it fills the entire room with light, for Thresh's children have returned. But then Thresh noticed that we look worried, and so he immediately turned his attention to us, asking us what's happening. Then we get to ask him who made him suffer, and so Thresh reveals even more about the lore of the spirit realm. He told us that once, the entire spirit realm lived in harmony under Thresh's guidance. But then came a little fox. Where she came from, Thresh didn't know. But she was a natural charmer. It was quite a while ago, and only time knew when she appeared. Once again, time with a capital T. At first, the fox was a friend with Thresh, and they explored the spirit realm together. They were both helping souls, and in general they were similar in many ways. Still, there was one difference between them. Thresh wanted to protect the souls, but the fox believed that the souls were able to survive alone. At first, Thresh wanted to believe her, and he trusted her. But over time, he couldn't imagine the innocent lost ones without a guidance, each carrying their suffering into death. To this day, Thresh sees letting the fox have her way as the greatest mistake he had ever made. He then mentions that he would do anything to protect the roaming souls that followed Ari, which gave us the perfect opportunity to offer our help, which Thresh greatly appreciated. And so we ventured into the woods to collect as many souls which followed Ari as possible. But to make the task easier, Thresh trusted us so much, he gave us his own hook and lantern. Then, the moment we see the first wild spirit, we try to hit it with the hook, but we miss. And the spirit realm literally pings us with a yellow question mark. Then we try again, we land the hook, and we capture the first spirit inside the lantern. After a while, we return to Thresh with a lantern full of souls, which were originally led by Ari. And Thresh couldn't be happier. His home was filled with beautiful lights, and his children were safe. After this task, Thresh was so grateful, he decided to show us something no one else had seen before. And so, Thresh leaps over his river of souls and leaves his lantern behind. When we take the lantern, we get transported to Thresh's sanctuary, which is where Thresh shares his, and I quote, most intimate moments. Not only that, in this place, Thresh looks a lot manlier. Here, Thresh just thanks us for everything we have done for him, and he really appreciates our friendship. Later, he invites us to sit down, and his hand gently caresses our own. After that, instead of sending us home, Thresh invites us to stay with him in the spirit realm. However, there is no option to accept that offer. And so, with a heavy heart, Thresh lets us go. And that's the end of Thresh's story. Now, since Ari was mentioned a lot here, let's go through hers next. Her storyline starts with her being just the fox. But as we follow her, she immediately recognizes that we are not a spirit. Although she's not entirely sure what we are. Then she offers us to follow her to safety. Or to stay here. It was our choice. After all, we just learned from Thresh that Ari believed that souls could survive on their own. As we follow her, we end up at a shrine. And the fox explains that this shrine was built for a beautiful woman who beckoned the dying to find peace. And then the fox transforms, revealing that she was the woman. She then introduces herself as Ari, and she explains that she is this realm's spirit of salvation. After that, she asks us if we remember how we got here. But regardless of what we say, we don't learn anything. Even if you say that you are chased by a clown, which might be an attempt to make surprise fiddlesticks canon. Or it's a Shaco teaser. Anyway, then Ari reveals that the reason why people often walk into this shrine, which was built in her image, was because the tail of the fox was quite common in the physical realm. 
And then we finally get to the part about the flow of time. She explained that time didn't flow here like it did in the physical realm. Here, the spirits were defined by the lives and the deaths of mortals. But nothing around them aged or changed. If you apply what she just said to the other spirits, this may actually explain why some spirits look weird. For example, Cassiopeia is a part snake, because that's how people picture her. That's what Ari meant by saying that the spirits can't change themselves, but they can be defined by mortals. Anyway, Ari then explains why it's a problem that we don't know if we are alive. It's because we don't belong in this realm. And here time flows at a different rate. Years will go by days, decades by years. And by the time we return, the world will have changed. She then also points out that lately, the souls in the spirit realm were starting to get misdirected. And they ended up in the wrong appointed places in their afterlives. And so Ari asked us to help her by finding some of those lost souls. At the end of this part, she mentions that she hopes that we will get out of here soon, because over time we may end up turning into a demon. Which is a reference to what we learned from the other stories, that all the Akana in this realm started as mortals, with the exception of Kindred. Speaking of which, the next time we meet Ari, we see she's talking to Kindred, but the moment they notice us, they run away. After this awkward interruption, Ari is grateful that we helped her by guiding some spirits to her. And she mentions that some spirits are lost to their obsessions, by which she is referencing Thresh. And she even reveals that some of these spirits turn into demons. She then reveals what she had learned from Kindred. Every year during the Spirit Blossom Festival, the veil between the two realms is the thinnest. But this year something changed. There is a large influx of souls that get sent here. And that got the attention of Thresh. Here I quickly want to point out that this large influx of souls pouring into the spirit realm was likely caused by Noxians trying to take over Ionia. Anyway, just like every spirit in every story so far, for some reason Ari was weakened. Somehow. So she couldn't fight Thresh and lead the souls to safety. However, with more souls by her side, she might be strong enough. And so she asked us to go back into the woods and bring her even more souls. And we had to do it quickly. We couldn't stay in this realm for long. If the balance was thrown off, we could get stuck in a limbo. After collecting enough souls, we join Ari and we travel to Thresh's lair. Once we're there, Ari is hesitant, because she was always playing just one part of a larger game. But now she was supposed to be the hero of the spirit realm, and she wasn't even sure if she could beat Thresh. Interestingly though, I want to point out that here Ari called Thresh an obsessed king which is a reference to the fact that once he ruled the realm. Anyway, after a bit of convincing, the two of us walk in and we finally meet Thresh. There, Thresh is just talking about how he wants to save all those poor lost souls. Which sounds like he's the bad guy and he's mocking Ari. But after going through his story, we know he really means it. Strangely though, when Thresh talks to us, he's actually able to manipulate us into following him. And to a certain degree, he can control what we say. But thankfully, with all the collected souls, Ari was strong enough to unleash her true form. And so she demanded to know why Thresh was taking all of those souls for himself. There Thresh revealed that he was only protecting the souls because Ari was weak. But now that she reclaimed her powers, he was happy to go back and focus on his half of the spirit realm. But then Ari started demanding more. She wanted all the souls Thresh claimed to be free, which Thresh was willing to do, under one condition. Once he freed them, the souls would be allowed to find their way back home on their own. Should they become lost, Thresh and Ari would have a chance to lure them in. This scene ends with Ari being confused again. She wasn't sure how she awakened this powerful form, but she guessed it might have been because of us. The next time we meet Ari, she is still in her powerful form, but she was just done helping another spirit find peace. Then, when she notices us, she swaps back to her normal form. And finally, she reveals that while we were away, she found out that we were actually alive and that we weren't supposed to be in the spirit realm yet. She then points out that right now we were on a special beach where spirits feel at ease after their long lives. But it was also the place where spirits first arrived. Then she noted that she feels at ease around us. Not just because all of the things we have done for her, but also because we have helped a lot of other souls find peace. 
After that, regardless if you flirt with Ari or not, she kisses you on the cheek and simply disappears. Now, with most of the spirits covered, let's move on to the last normal one, before we get to the two brothers. So now, on to Lilia. Lilia kinda became famous by asking us why are we wearing clothes, at literally the first moment you meet her. Of course, she asked you that, because the souls in the spirit realm don't need clothes, which made Lilia think that perhaps we are alive. Anyway, because Lilia felt uncomfortable around clothed spirits, we get at least partially naked. After that, we follow Lilia into the woods. Eventually, we end up in a burned forest. And Lilia explains that this forest is a reflection of one in the physical realm. This might be a totally blind reach, but the only known Ionian forest that became ruined was the one that protected Omikayalan, the world tree at the heart of the world. So perhaps this burned forest is the spiritual reflection of that place. Anyway, right after that, a flaming spirit approaches us. But Lilia tells us to calm down, because this was just one of the tree's nightmares. She then explained that all the burnt trees around us were actually not trees. They were the souls of all humans, animals and plants who got burned to death. And now they were stuck here, lost in obsession. Then Lilia asks us for help. We don't really know what she needs to do, but we learn that together we'll have to face death. Apparently, when the forest burned, death took everything from Lilia. And that's why she was happy to have us around. We were the first friend she found in quite some time. Then Lilia tells us that she wants to face death because she wants to take back everything she had lost. After that, Lilia gives us a stick that came from one of the burnt trees. She did it because the trees told her to do it. The stick had buds on it that were yet to bloom. And according to Lilia, the stick was good for hitting people or poking them. And so, armed with a stick, Lilia nudged us into a pool of water that transported us directly to death. Keep in mind that Lilia was too scared to meet death herself, so we got here alone. When death finally meets us, the lamb explained that it is true that they took all the souls. But after that, it was the fox who guided the souls and let them all find peace. So in reality, all the souls already found peace. In fact, they were probably not in the trees anymore. But Lilia was still stuck in an endless loop of obsession. She clung onto the memories of the burned forest, because that's all she had left. The lamb then tells us to return to Lilia with the stick. If we hurried, we would be able to save her. And so we run back to Lilia as fast as we can, and we try to explain the situation. Unfortunately, Lilia doesn't get it. And she tries to argue back that she can still hear the souls. Under one tree, she could hear a girl who was proud she lost her first tooth. She wanted to show her grandmother, but then she got enveloped by smoke and she fell asleep. Under a different tree, Lilia heard an old man who always left an offering at Lilia's shrine. He wanted to become a crane, so he could eat fish even without teeth, but he too got claimed by the fires. Lilia heard many more dreams like these. It was birds, people, even the water. Lilia then pointed out that she was the forest itself. She loved its denizens like her own children, and helping them made her bloom. But now it was quiet, and she could only hear the dreams. When we tell her that death told us that Lilia was stuck in her nightmare, lost in obsession, it takes Lilia a while till she realizes that this would mean that she would be asleep, and all the dreams she was hearing would actually be just her own dreams. After this realization, the branch she gave us started to bloom, and it pulled us further and further into the forest. Eventually, we ended up in front of our own sleeping body, which was still closed. This means that this entire time, from the moment we met Lilia, and before we got naked, we were actually asleep. And Lilia interacted with us through our dream. Then, without explanation, the world fades to black. And after a while, we hear Lilia's voice. At first we hear Lilia going through all the conversations which we just had. But then she tells us that within her forest, when the living dream, spirits awake. And then after some references to the Awakened cinematic, we actually wake up. After that, Lilia tries to explain what happened. Apparently she was the one who accidentally put us to sleep using her smoking staff. At least that's what Lilia dreamed about. She then asked if we remember what we dreamed about. Because even though this might sound confusing, 
she had the option to show us our own dream. But when she did that, things suddenly started making sense. We were now standing in a beautiful blooming forest. Because that's what grew from the seed, which we planted with our own dream. In other words, when in the dream our stuff started blooming, after which we woke up, the dream didn't end, it kept going. And now the blooming branch spread into a blooming forest. After that, Lilia tells us that she realized she had to let go of her past dreams. The more she held onto them, the more they turned into nightmares. But now that she let go, she could finally see how beautiful all the dreams that moved on were. At the end of this story, you have the option to point out that the two of you technically dreamed about each other. Which makes Lilia engage the ultimate blush. And then she just runs away. And finally, this takes us to the last two stories. The ones about the two ancient brothers. So, let's start with Yasuo. When you first meet Yasuo, aka the legendary younger brother, you hear the sound of a demon. Here you have the option to face it, run, or force yourself to faint. If you do that, you actually faint, and you don't get to see Yasuo killing the demon. After that, the new reveals start pouring in. When you tell Yasuo that you are not a demon, that you are just a person, he replies that all demons start as people, but they were just wrecked with longing. Then, because these woods were filled with demons, Yasuo decided to leave. And you followed him. On our way we hear a flute playing, and we find a stone pillar that had a poem inscribed into it. Brothers turned to blades, speak only through clashing steel, hearts bound and silenced. Then we catch up with Yasuo, and he immediately asks us if we liked his music. Once we tell him that it was good, he answers that he's used to being lonely, since in the spirit realm he doesn't have too many people to play to. Right after that, Yasuo introduces himself as the spirit of heroism. He's defined by daring deeds, feats of bravery, and standing for what's right against all odds. He then jokes that if he was any better with his flute, perhaps he could have been the spirit of melody, or something like that. Interestingly enough, then we get another cool reveal. When we ask him why can't he be both, by which we mean the spirit of heroism and melody, he tells us that even the spirits follow certain rules, and apparently his soul was more attuned to fighting than music. Back in Kindred's storyline, they also mentioned that all spirits follow certain rules, because that's simply how things were in the spirit realm, but we don't get to learn what makes these rules. Anyway, then Yasuo quickly explained his story. Which we already know, because on this channel, we talked about the legend of the two brothers a lot. In short, him and his brother came from a long line of swordsmen. So to him, music was just a nice distraction, when the battles were over. Then, for a moment, Yasuo dreads the fact that perhaps if he chose the flute instead of the sword, he and his brother would be still alive. As a nice touch, Yasuo also mentions that after all, the wolf is always waiting to make a meal of us. Which means that perhaps the old clan of the two brothers revered the wolf since they were all warriors. But then he notices that we don't have the marks of the wolf on us, so perhaps we were still alive. This meant that even though it was too late for Yasuo, we were still free to live our life to its fullest. That's why Yasuo asked us what we would like to do. And no matter what you reply, or how crazy the answer is, Yasuo fully supports you. Then he just leaves and he lets you do whatever you wanted to do. The next time we return to him, he asks us how did it go with our life goals. But this time, no matter what you tell him, Yasuo becomes sad that he wasn't a better musician. And he explains that the musical arts weren't really appreciated in a warrior family. On top of that, his brother was mad that he didn't train with the sword more. And here he calls his relationship with his brother stained. Although they were best bros when they were young. In fact, while Yasuo was playing the flute, his brother was writing poems, and they were encouraging each other. Then Yasuo revealed that as they grew older, because Yone, aka the elder brother, was the firstborn, he had to endure a lot of pressure from his clan. That's why, to him, honor was always above all, and he never stopped training with his sword. And when Yasuo grew up, and it was time for him to pick up the sword as well, he had mixed feelings about it. Even though, from the first moment Yasuo picked up his blade, his talents were natural. And so, despite his lack of training, he still became better than his brother. And that naturally made Yone train even harder. Eventually, Yone told Yasuo, talent without focus brings dishonor. 
After which, the two brothers went separate ways, becoming regional lords like their forefathers had planned. From there, the rivalry only grew. Until the day the two brothers met on the battlefield. Here when we ask Yasuo why did they fight, he doesn't tell us anything, because it was getting dark, and so he offered to make camp. The next day he would guide us to the lands of the Kanmei, where Ari was. Which, by the way, this isn't explained anywhere, but the spirits are divided into the Akana, which Cassiopeia explained can be translated as demons, and the Kanmei, which Yasuo explained stands for benevolent spirits. But I assume that the lands of the Akana are on the left of the map, because that's where we were now, and the lands of the Kanmei were on the right, that's where Ari was. The next day we are woken up by Yasuo's flute, and we immediately get on the road. Unfortunately, Yasuo isn't sure which way to go, and so we first end up in Lilia's forest. And Yasuo even recognizes these woods as a spiritual reflection of a place he knew in the physical realm. He also points out things we learned from Lilia, such as the fact that this forest contains the spirits of all living things, including animals and plants, and that all of them were lost to obsession and madness here. However, it was also possible that the spirits were gone, and they might have been destroyed, and if that happened, Yasuo would likely meet them again. Here we got yet another reveal. Yasuo tells us that the spirits of the living can be destroyed by demons, because demons feed on negative emotions, while the most powerful demons feed on the most immoral. However, most demons can be destroyed too, though Yasuo revealed it's not exactly easy. And he even mentions that we probably know about this, as we are likely familiar with the poem of the Ten Great Kings. And with this, he is referring to the Ten Kings, which Fiddlesticks mentioned. Fiddlesticks, end of men. Fiddlesticks, first of ten. The reason why this is really cool is because when you realize that this younger brother came from the ancient legend and he comes from times before there ever was a conflict, it reveals how incredibly ancient Fiddlesticks has to be, since even at the beginning of human civilizations, people knew about this poem. Unfortunately, we don't get to learn what the poem of the Ten Great Kings says. However, from context, we can assume it mentions how the demons can be destroyed. Anyway, once we tell Yasuo that we don't know what the poem says, he just mocks us by saying that this was more popular during his time. After some more traveling, we finally arrive at the Fox's Shrine. Here Yasuo just tells us to follow the path, but before he leaves, he tells us that when he arrived in the spirit realm, he saw a path laid out before him, he followed the fox, but midway through, he thought he saw his brother, guided by the lantern. However, he ignored him and he continued following the path. Then, once he reached the end of this path, he realized he was at the beginning again, he was stuck in a loop. Ever since that, he's been looking for his brother. Here he quickly mentioned that in their final battle, the two brothers killed each other. So perhaps Yone was right when he once told him that two brothers can speak only through clashing steel. But then, we realize that we have read those exact words on the stone pillar at the beginning of the story, and so we sprint back to that pillar. When we arrive there, Yasuo reads the full poem. Brothers turn to blade, speak only through clashing steel, hearts bound and silenced. Pierced, run through, they bleed, perishing by others' hands truths left unspoken. Mournful winds sweep through, carrying from better times, echoes of flute song. Simple melody, sweet notes traversing death's veil, conjures what once was. Before mortal wars, before pride, duty, honor, there were two brothers, and that was enough. Of course, Yasuo recognizes his brother's words, and so he knows these were written here by Yone. He had spent years thinking about what he would say to Yone, but he never stopped to think what would Yone say back. In fact, all of these years, Yasuo thought he could only get redemption through his sword, but Yone's words have done what slaying countless horrors could not. And so Yasuo was happy now, knowing that his brother had forgiven him. After this, he took us to the beginning, where he told us to follow our path, while he would go out and try to find Yone. With that, as he plays his flute for the last time for us, he simply disappears. And this takes us to the last Spirit Blossom story. The story of Yone, where things start getting really cool.
We first meet Yone in a quiet glade, after endlessly wandering around. And he immediately tells us that we do not belong here. He knows this because he had hunted dark spirits and demons. And we were neither. He then introduces himself as Yone. But you know, we know he's really the elder brother. Here we get to see that, just like Yasuo explained, Yone likes to talk in poems. In fact, he randomly spews out poems every time he thinks about his younger brother. Then he tells us that the Asakana prowl around, and suddenly one of them jumps out. Yeah, remember how Timo wanted to prank the Spirit of Reflection? By putting on Kindred's cloak and pretending to be a demon? Yeah, we get to see that from the other side. And just like Timo said, for a moment Yone actually believed that this was a real demon. But then, as Timo tries to be scary, it becomes obvious that this is just a prank. However, here comes the cool part. Since we are supposed to be helping Timo with the prank, how is it possible that we are just watching ourselves helping Timo? Well, we don't really learn why or how this is happening, but this weird timeline hopping will be referenced often during Yone's story. So yes, this is the first time we actually encounter a different version of ourselves. If we don't count the fact that before, we helped Timo prank Thresh, only to get ourselves pranked. Anyway, once it is obvious that this is not an Asakana, Timo jumps out and he laughs at us, and then he runs away. You then have the option to point out that this demon seemed familiar. This makes Yone reveal how much he hates Timo, but then he stops, unsure if we meant the person Timo was sitting on. Because that person did seem familiar. And that's, of course, because that person was us from another timeline. After that, Yone curses himself for being so dumb as to fall for this prank, which he followed by another random poem. Patience, discipline, lessons I try to impart, yet I am the student. He then reveals that he is just trying to save others who would be in danger, but he keeps failing. Here he was known as the spirit of reflection. He was defined by his lonely path and hunting down Azakana, even though he wasn't sure what the point of it was. He doesn't know who he is saving, who he is defending, and why he must do it alone. After this, Yone mentions his younger brother. He was a great swordsman who liked to play the flute. But ultimately, it was Yone who pushed him to focus on the sword. Perhaps if he hadn't done that, things would have been better. Then Yone goes through the exact same story Yasuo explained. How the two became lords who eventually turned against each other. But the more he doubted himself, the more Yone turned into a demon. Yone in his demonic form then runs into the mountains and we follow him. There he transforms back. Once we tell him what happened, he is sad that even here in the spirit realm he can't find peace. And he thanks us for being so brave as to follow him. He then explains that what we saw was his Azakana trying to get him. Apparently, when he first arrived in his realm, he was attacked by an Azakana, which he tried to describe as lingering doubts of one's past. And he adds that the word Azakana means little demon. Once these Azakana feed on enough dark emotions, they turn into Akana, or demon. So now since we know that Azakana means little demon, while Akana is just a demon, that means that the prefix Aza means little. Perhaps we should remember this for the future. But the awesome thing is that after this, Yone tells us that long before the others, there were 10 Akana that were unlike the other. But apparently that story is too long, so he wanted to save it for another time. Of course, by these 10 unusual Akana, he was referencing the 10 great kings, which we have heard about before. This confirms that Fiddlesticks isn't just any kind of a demon. He is one of the first to ever exist. Which makes it scary, because one of his quotes hints that he was also able to devour the others. Then Yasuo reveals that the reason why he turned into a demon for a moment was because this happens when he loses himself to his own doubts. After which Yone became mad at himself for almost killing us, by not making peace with his past. Then he spews out another poem, before telling us that he's been searching for his brother the entire time. This makes him even sadder, and so Yone just leaves us, and he starts looking for Yasuo alone. After walking for what the story described felt like thousand years, we meet Yone again. But as we speak to him, the story reveals that we have actually gone through the other storylines while we were gone in this one. So when Yone looks into our eyes and he asks us if we have met his brother, we have the option to say yes. 
At this point, I should mention that throughout Yone's story, you have the option to use modern slangs. But because Yone is quite terrible at reading sarcasm, and he doesn't know what these modern terms mean, he always takes it literally. Which turns into quite hilarious scenes. Such as the one where Yone hoped he too could be dope as hell. Anyway, the reason why I'm saying this is because we have the option to tell him that we have met his brother. He did a sweet kickflip and he high-fived God. After which Yone immediately wants to know what is a kickflip, what is a high-five and which God were we referring to. Anyway, to Yone this confirmed that not only did Yasuo's skills become even greater, it also confirmed that Yasuo was here. And so there was a chance to find him. After that, Yone gave us even more context as to why the two brothers fought in the past. It was because while they were lords, Yone branded his brother as a traitor, just so he could face him in combat. So technically, it was the elder brother who started it all. That's why Yone now thought that his brother had to hate him, and that he would probably never forgive him. However, with some careful convincing, we make Yone try to find Yasuo and attempt to get his forgiveness. And so, we lead Yone back to the beach where it all started. At first, he's not sure what he should tell his brother. So, we suggest a poem, which is an idea Yone liked a lot. And so, he pulled out his sword and he started carving a poem into the stone pillar. In fact, he had carved the exact same poem we had found during Yasuo's story. And the story even points out that somehow we feel like we have read this poem before, but perhaps it was just a dream. Which is yet another hint that in the Spirit Blossom realm, we are somehow time skipping. After this, Yone is grateful that we helped him talk to his brother, even though it wasn't directly. Then he asks us if there is anything he could do for us in return. And here, believe it or not, you have the option to ask Yone to kiss you on the mouth. Which he does. Sort of. He kisses us on the cheek, telling us that the cheek is the mouth of the soul. Maybe. After this, the two of you sit on the beach and enjoy each other's company. The end. And that was the full story of the entire Spirit Blossom event. However, the day I am going to release this video, the event will end. And we will get extra cutscenes based on who you gave the Spirit Pedals to. On top of that, even though these stories were supposed to be about us finding way back to the mortal realm, none of the spirits actually helped us do that. At best, they only helped us find the right direction. But the reveal of how we actually get back should come at the very end of the event. Hello there, I am from the future that has witnessed the endings. So Ari revealed that we can get back to the physical realm with the help of the giant spirit tree that was in the middle the entire time. We still don't get any details though. And depending on who you have given the spirit pedals to, the characters will now come to you and say their goodbye. Unfortunately, we don't learn anything cool from them. Although, for example, Timo has a really cool reference to the skin's bio. According to the bio, Spirit Blossom Timo always dreamed of becoming golden. Because, you know, that's a stupid dream and he can troll people with it. However, to get rid of Timo, Ari actually decides to make Timo golden. And that's the lore behind his prestige skin. But that's all we learned. So, all that's left to say now is...